Greetings, everyone. And thank you for hopping aboard the bus for the final day of ALA's Holding Space Tour. My name is Julius C. Jefferson, Jr., and I am the president of the American Library Association. And today, we are delighted to have you with us. And you are in for a treat, believe me. We're going to do a double header today. I don't know if you like baseball, but this is what we call a double header because we will be starting here in Oakland, California, and we will be finishing in Honolulu, Hawaii uh, with a program and celebration at 4 p.m. Central. So right after this, I think there's a little break and then we'll go right into it. So um, <clears throat> today we begin with Listen to Kids, Youth and Family Centered Practices at Oakland Public Library. And I had the privilege of speaking with members of the Oakland Public Library Children's and Youth Services team about their amazing community-centered programming. So we're gonna start with those interviews and then we will be joined by Oakland's Youth Poet Laureates for live conversation and performances. So sit back, relax, and roll the video. We are in Oakland with Mahasan Aline. I want to thank you for getting on the bus with us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Tell us a little bit about your role at the Oakland Public Library. Yes, I've worked at the Oakland Public Library for just, um, well, just over six years. Um, I am the Children's Collection Management Librarian for the system. I'm also um, very involved in our uh, racial equity team. Um, I co-lead that and I'm really proud of the timely work <laughs> we're doing that to try to make sure that um, all of our policies, procedures, you know, programs are all um, working toward racial justice. I understand that you are a former ALA Spectrum Scholar. I am. A few years ago, um, I was honored to become part of the Spectrum family, and um, it's a wonderful program. I try to tell everybody who is eligible um, to apply, to do so, and it's just really been a wonderful investment in, um, in Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, you know, in library services. The investment in us, I think particularly being able to come um, to ALA, um, sponsored visit, you know, that was my first ALA conference. I came to my spectrum, spectrum year. That was wonderful. And the institute that they hold, the Leadership Institute that is held for Spectrum scholars at the end of their year, it was just wonderful to meet so many library professionals who are really invested in their communities. I got a lot of really great advice about how to approach my career um, and how to be a asset to others, both within the library profession and within, in, uh, in the communities we serve. And it was just really meaningful how um, conscious um, the other ALA scholars and community are about um, you know, just wanting to make the world a better place through through libraries. So definitely inspirational. Tell me about the Touch Points curriculum and how that came to be at Oakland Public Library. Touch Points is a uh, was developed by um, I think Dr. Brazelton is his name, a pediatrician out of Massachusetts. What I really appreciate about the model is, you know, we choose to believe that all parents have strengths. We choose to believe all parents want to do well by their child, and it's we we believe that parenting is a process built on trial and error, and it's just been really. Um, good to use as well the guiding principles that the framework um, offers such as you know value passion where you find it um, recognize our own our own selves and what we bring to the interaction and I, I think it's been transformational in um, our approach to really um, valuing what our community brings to the library and partnering with families um, in the very necessary um, role of rearing our next generations. We continue to have quarterly touch point circles um, uh, in our library system where um, someone who had gone through the training would just come back and open up a, a space to further talk about how we engage these assumptions, both their assumptions we make about parents, assumptions we make about staff, and then the principles, how is this coming into practice and it was just really a great opportunity to deepen our work to humble ourselves and um 
to just give space for being better. I think sometimes there's so much going on from moment to moment. There are programs, there's collection development, there's, you know, there's staff needs that um, making that space to improve is just really, really important. So I really appreciate Touchpoint's ability to have us slow down, think, and deepen our, our practice. Touchpoints framework is for a younger audience officially, but I think it also helps us with the youth um, who are older because it frames things within what's developmentally appropriate, where kids are developmentally. That's the whole thing about the phrase touch points. It's about, it's this idea that there are moments in child rearing and child development where there's going to be the, 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 the word is disorganization. <laughs> that moment is a touch point for us. That's a moment for us to lean in and to touch what's going on with the family so that when they walk away, they see the library as a place where they can come and, you know, as a part of their community. We tried to really communicate that the Oakland Public Library has a strength-based approach to how we see our community and that we respect where parents are coming from. We inherently see parents as wanting to do their best and when there are opportunities to support even in hard situations that that is going to be our approach mm -hmm. um, and so i think um I, I think that we have been successful in that there's always opportunity for growth um, but i really appreciate the commitment from our library to this model and view of you know of, of our community we are very um protective as an organization of spaces for our families. We prioritize in making sure that families feel welcome. It's an ongoing, you know, goal. It's an ongoing practice. Just the emphasis on having physical space and holding space and being willing to advocate for our, our families. Um, I think when we're doing it best, we have families who come in and feel really comfortable bringing in their kids, talking to staff. You know, we have the uh, free lunch in the summers. We have snacks all year round when we're, when we're open. Um, so I think just the culture of families feeling welcome. We have lots of families who, where we develop these personal relationships, who are open to come in and really asking for advice about very personal things. And I feel comfortable through this talking about some personal things. So I can just think of a number of relationships where parents have like maybe struggled with their children in the library, but they've known they can keep coming back. And we have continued to try to find a space for them um, and make them feel comfortable in the library, whether it's a parent's got to do a job application and um, they don't have anybody to watch their children and so they've got to bring their child and maybe their child's making a little noise that's, you know, uh, that's affecting other folks. So it's, it's like strategizing. And this parent really has got to do this job application. We're the only place where they can go and do this. What can we do to support this parent and support this child when it's a developmentally typical um, you know, behavior in a way that the parent feels supported, the child has something that's engaged, and the rest of the community also sees that this is a value, but then, you know, we also are, are, are working together. So I think we have a, if you were to ask librarians, you'd hear a lot of those stories about people just coming back, sharing their struggles, asking for support, and also sharing their successes. Wow, Mahasan, I really want to say great work. So, Thank you for getting on the bus with us. Oh, <laughs> I'm happy to be on the bus. <laughs> Thank, you, Thank for, you for having me. Soon, I hope to see you in person and visit. And oh, so, that would be awesome. We have Manny and Jason. Well, my name is Jason and um, I'm a security guard. I've been working at the library for about nine years, going on 10 and um, my coworkers, they look to me as a uh, mentor because of my relationship that I've built while I've been here. My name is Manny Hernandez. I'm a library assistant here at Oakland Public Library. I've been working in Oakland Public Library for 13 years now. And uh, I've worked in many different roles, but the one I'm currently in, the shoes that I'm wearing today is probably by far my favorite. I'm supporting programming and outreach. You both have started a program called the Fatherhood Circle. 
And the way this program got started was just listening and responding to our community that we're serving here. There's a, a, a lack of services and programs in supporting fathers and father figures. And so we wanted to create something that just opened up our lens a little bit to be able to support our father figures out there in our community. The response to the program has been very pleasant. A lot of parents and a lot of men have been coming and, you know, they've been able to voice, you know, they've been able to voice and, and talk about stuff, you know, for fathers. Talk to me about how it actually works. Well, taking a little step back, uh, talking about community, Jason he actually grew up down the street from here, a few blocks, and all the youth, uh, their parents, even some of the grandparents know Jason from just walking these streets uh, in his early years. And uh, me for myself, I'm rooted, born and raised, went to school here in Oakland, friends and family are all here. So when it comes down to creating something that serves our community, um, I'll have to say that me and Jason know community pretty well. So we wanted to create something that um, spoke to our people, spoke to our community. It started off very organically where we we're just talking in a library environment and Father figures and men just started to gravitate towards each other and engage in communication. So we figured that it was time to create a space, a time, a designated program for all these stories to live and for us to come together. I grew up in a household without the father. So I know what it's like. You know, that's the reason why I, I, I love this program. It's like a family setting. We all get, we all sit up and we, you know, get some food and it's no judgment. Everybody gets to talk and, you know, they just express themselves without having to be judged by anyone. We, we kind of created a set rules for the program so that anyone who's walking into the space has a neutral respect for the program and the rules we kind of laid out there. So whatever is said in this program environment is going to stay here and we're not going to take it out into the streets or into anyone's home. It stays here and lives here in a safe, warm place. Hosting these fatherhood circles, um, why do you think it was important that it be at the, at the public library? All right, people love the library. Anything associated with the library, it's just, it's a positivity that's lifted in the community. And that's something that we hold on to and we run with it with every single program that we provide. And it's also a reflection of how me and Jason build on relationships with anyone who walks into the library. We, uh, we, we hold that value. Manny, I hear that Oakland Public Library has offered story time at a neighborhood laundromat. That is correct. And this program holds a special place in my heart. These four walls can be a bit restricting uh, for the type of services and programs we want to create. And especially when you bring in the whole edge of how we connect with communities and we try to build on communities and support families, this opportunity just naturally uh, spoke to us and developed. Uh, we've been in partnership with this laundromat in the east side of East Oakland and the ownership just so happens to be uh, past educators who have then started this business and reached out to Oakland Public Library to do a partnership. And what they did there is they created a space, a safe corner in their laundromat to be able to host community partners to come and present and provide different services in which we were granted the opportunity to come out and do story time. What started off as just one story time kind of unfolded to uh, us bringing in more staff members on board to support this opportunity to be able to really reach in free book giveaways and a story time and a pup show and different types of crafts based out of this laundry mat. This is considered a pilot for us and now we're looking into different partnerships of how we can provide more services like this outside of the library and uh, branch out to the laundromats, um, hopefully in the near future. I think one of the most meaningful expressions is it's not necessarily given by words, but uh, it's given by the biggest smile that you see. And um, I'm just reflecting now on, on a few of the experiences and um, seeing youth running to the, to, I'm sorry, to the laundromat with just a big smile and open arms ready to give me and all the supporting staff uh, a big hug. For me, uh, that action just speaks louder than any words. It's a struggle in today's day in life to maintain a household. And so to be able to unite services on, with somebody's family uh, in a neutral space like a laundromat, it's been uh, really special. I, I'm, I'm hearing that there's, there's also something about a bike library as well. Uh, I love bikes and I love books. So uh, we yeah. use a bike library um, to provide the service and it is the absolute best 
icebreaker. To see a gentleman or librarians just riding down the street on a bicycle with hauling a trailer full of books, it's just a wonderful sight. And it's one of our tools that we use here in Oakland Public Library. And we actually have a fleet of them. And so whenever we roll into the family laundromat with this trailer full of books, which is our mobile bike library, it's already an icebreaker. And we have families presenting themselves to us, uh, engaging and wondering about the books on the bike trailer. Hey, Manny and Jason, you guys are doing some outstanding work in Oakland. And I am so happy that you took the time to join us on this virtual bus. Um, thank you for what you're doing. Creative, innovative. I really appreciate your work. Best of luck with the rest of your tour. Take care. We are here with Miriam Meadow from the Oakland Public Library. And I want to thank you for joining us on the bus. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Oakland Public Library and the community that you serve. Uh, my official role is that I'm children's librarian at the Diamond Branch of Oakland Public Library, though since our facilities have closed, that's look a little bit different. I've been doing sidewalk service most recently, making sure that we're getting materials into the hands of community members, even though our library spaces are closed. Oakland, it's about 430,000 people, and we're across the bay from San Francisco. And Oakland's one of the most racially and culturally diverse communities in the entire world. The community we serve in the library, we, we see all ages, abilities, language skills, gender presentations, sexuality, family structures, income levels, j just about all of it. So our patrons represent a wide range of interests and also needs and social positions. Miriam, I understand that you coordinate a program called Family Pride? Every June is Pride Month and the fourth weekend, I believe it is, of each June, San Francisco has a huge Pride event. They, they have activities all weekend long uh, and there's not too much that goes on in Oakland and in the East Bay during that Pride weekend. Uh, so for, for years, I would offer an LGBTQ family story time to be able to offer families in the East Bay something to go to if they wanted to celebrate Pride, but they didn't want to deal with the crowds or the transportation. They didn't want to take their families all the way to, to San Francisco. And we, we would have really sweet events for, for those story times. But then in 2017, uh, it, it, it was about the time when Drag Queen Story Hours were happening more frequently. And I really wanted to bring in Drag Queen Story Hour for, for a family pride event. But um, my, my facility, my building was being remodeled. And so I wasn't able to host an event in my library. So I reached out to the Parks and Rec lead, um, who's at the park just a couple blocks away from, from my library. And she was an enthusiastic partner. She was all about bringing in Drag Queen Story Hour. And so we hosted an event um, at, at the Parks and Rec facility and more than 300 people came. So it was really clear to us at that point that we had hit on something that, that the community was interested in. And she was so great to partner with that we decided to do it again the next year. But we didn't want to be in an, in an inside space because it was a little too crowded with, with the turnout we had. So the following year, we used the outdoor park space and we had drag queen and drag king story hours. We had face painting. Uh, we did a book giveaway. We invited the Oakland Museum of California to come and lead a craft and they were really happy to partner with us for that too. We had um, huge games like an enormous connect four game that, that was out in, in the in the park uh, and we had did I mention food? There was food. It was really good. And we had a big turnout for that too. So we did it again in 2019. And at that point, I was thinking about how this could be instead of something that was just local to, to the branch that I serve, that maybe this was something that we could have be an annual event that the Oakland Public Library offered every year and that I wasn't always coordinating, that we could bring some other people into coordinating the event. And that's what it was going to be in 2020. Um, we were scheduled to, to have an event at an amphitheater by Lake Merritt 
Lake Merritt is called the Jewel of Oakland. It's a gorgeous space and it would be an incredible place for a family event like this. Um, because of COVID-19, it all got shut down and we had some really great virtual events, um, but hopefully in 2021, when it's safe again for us to gather, we'll be able to, to have that big family pride event again. So you started in 2017 and it was pretty much uh, just local for your branch. By 2020, this, this became a citywide event or it would have been a citywide event for, for this year? It, yeah, it would have been. <laughs> I think that libraries are uniquely positioned as government agencies to be able to support racial and social justice organizations. In Oakland, we have so many community-led organizations that are, are focused on individuals who are most impacted by systems of oppression, um, by systems of inequity. And if you look at the Oakland Public Library's stated values, it includes diversity and equity, community empowerment, inclusion. And I think that there's no better way to enact the commitment to those values than to, to leverage the resources that we have. That would be our, our spaces, our budgets, our staff, our, our connections to other organizations and individuals um, in, in support of, of these organizations that have been on the ground doing this work for, for years, for ages. Wow. Was this something that you had been involved in, in, in Pride or um, just, just, you know, the LGBT community before you, you know, you sort of were thinking about this? Uh, definitely. I've, I've lived in, in Oakland for 16 years and I am queer and have participated in, in Pride events personally for, for, for years and years and years. Um, so, so there's definitely a bit of, of bringing my personal interest to, to the work when, when I've, I've put my efforts behind Family Pride events. So what do you think that the 21 will look like? I mean, you're, gonna, you're off a year. This was going to be a big year with Citywide. Are you beginning to plan for 21? Um, so we haven't started planning for 2021 yet, but um, there there have been talks about about being able to figure out some sort of karaoke. Um, last year we had a queer taiko group come that was incredible. We might bring them back because um, in an outdoor space they can be so loud. Stay tuned. We're still going to plan something great. I can't wait. I can't wait to to hear about the 2021 event. And so. it's a celebration. It's a party. It, it's a really good time. I promise that one day soon, I will be in Oakland and we will be able to meet face to face. All right. I look forward to it. Thanks, uh Julius. My name is Anthony Propernick. I'm a senior library assistant here with the Oakland Public Library. My role is in uh, community engagement and outreach. My name is RB. Um, I'm a library aide at Oakland Public Library um, and I coordinate bikes to books programs at OPL and I'm an East Oakland resident, born and raised. Oh, how about, and, and proud of it too. Right. <laughs> I understand uh, the two of you supervise a bike program for youth. Yeah, so the Scraper Bike Team was funded in 2007, um, and it's a, a native bike of Oakland, so we use duct tape and candy wrappers um, and spare bike parts to get creative and support youth entrepreneurship through creativity. Can you describe what a scraper bike is? Um, a scraper bike is a bike that's brightly colored and decorated in bright flamboyant colors. We utilize spare bike parts to make one awesome bike. And then you ride the bike and get around town. Uh, we, we, ride, we ride the bike, uh, we do parades, uh, we do bike rides, video shoots, commercials. Why have a, a, a youth bike program at the library? It came about for us in 2014. I first, uh, see, I've seen RB around and some of the events that he had been talking about. I'm an avid cyclist and RB is involved in a lot of community programming in East Oakland. It was Earth Day uh, event that I, we, we connected and we talked a little bit about bike stuff. He was there with a bunch of youth. And then the next month on Bike to Work Month, we had an event here where we were fixed bikes. So people show, start showing up to ask us to fix their bikes and we got overwhelmed. Um, so the need kind of came organically to us 
And I had known RB from uh, some of some events and I, and I knew the good work that he was doing um, and asked him if he'd be interested in coming, coming around and, and setting up something formal to do bike clinics um, at, at the 8470 branch. And I'll, and I'll say that before, before we launched this, um, and still today, there are no bike shops in East Oakland. At the time, there wasn't anything from 50th to 107th. That's 57 blocks of no bike repair access. Um, so we were the first bike shop in town, and then we, we expanded that to our MLK branch on 69th, along with the Shed, our Martin Luther King branch. Now we have two bike shops in East Oakland. We're still the only two bike shops in East Oakland. So uh, the good work is something that we expanded on from RB and just kind of incorporated and figured out that as a need in the community. And the library wanted to facilitate and respond to that. The library stepped up um, to address the need of the community. Um, and we started fixing bikes for the community um, and helping the kids. Um, is there anything about how this program changes the way the youth interact with their communities, uh, neighbors, classmates, and others? What I've noticed is that RB embraces youth that a lot of our community has grown tired of or that, that are, have grown intolerant of. And I think um, it, he's changing youth that, that might be at risk of, of being sort of on the fringe and, and outside of, of mainstream uh, interactions with the community. I think in, by RB valuing them and bringing them in and, and, um, and helping with building behavioral and, and, um, and sort of community health ideas with them, I think they are then adapting and feeling, feeling respected and valued. And let me just ask you, Anthony, I'm looking at your background and I'm looking at, uh, let's say, Duct Tape Chris. Duct Tape Chris is a perfect example. Duct Tape Chris, um, got involved with the Scraper Bikes as a student next to, we have two small elementary schools next to our 81st Avenue branch and he got involved with RB and felt, became really good and skilled in helping others and doing his own wheels and you know he was in the Warriors Championship Parade. He's been celebrated and now we have examples of his work displayed in the library which further celebrates and recognizes him as a young person and you know I, I remember a while back he was, his parents were wanting to leave Oakland and duct tape Chris said, no, I can't leave Oakland. And they said, why not? He's like, I got too much going on here. <laughs> He's like, you know, he was, he was part of something big, he felt. That's what we're doing. And that's what RB is doing is like making these youth feel like they're part of something big and, um, and, they, and they matter. A lot of people talk about gentrification, which is what's currently going on in East Oakland. To combat gentrification is a thing called re-entrification. Shout out my new councilman, Lauren Taylor, for this phrase. Re-entrification is when we support youth entrepreneurship and we assure that the youth, um, they go to school, they get good grades. We give them alternatives to, to uh, what they subject to in the community as far as like gang violence and other stuff. Um, and understanding that there's no such thing as a bad kid. Being able to support the youth. Um, making sure that, that they, they're successful in whatever entrepreneurship they want to pursue, um, but just sparking that creativity um, through them decorating and making awesome bikes, I think that's the most powerful thing that uh, I have to offer. So I want to pivot real quick, and I want to talk to you about um, the, the community engagement and um, some of the partners that you work with on this bike team. We have two two sort of parallels of expertise here in the library system. We have our, our institutional knowledge and our, our um, librarians who come, who have a very strong background with their MLIS and sort of the functionings of a library in its traditional role. And I think as we learn to be relevant in a community and serve different communities, we need to um, find this other expertise that, which, is, which comes from the community uh, and, and understanding of the community. So we, we have a lot of partnerships, not just with organizations, but with individuals um, trying to develop relationships um, and acknowledging that like someone like RB is an expert as equally as value as, as any MLIS degree to bring in meaningful programming that, that matters and that represents what the community's needs and wants are. So we have uh, lots of programs. I think RB mentioned uh, Bike East Bay. We've worked with um, Communities for a Better Environment. We work with lots of organizations like the Scare Bike Team and Cycles of Change uh, and different interdepartmental uh, groups uh, such as uh, Oakland Department of uh, Transportation who's funding some of our bike programming because it's, they like what we do and they've, they've seen success so they want to keep it going. RB will talk about, he, he, he also interacts with a lot of different agencies in, in his roles as well. Uh, I wear a lot of hats in, the, in this city. Um, so 
I sit on the commission for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. So I advise Oakland um, on, on priorities in East Oakland as far as better biking and walking. I partner with East Oakland Collective. They're doing a lot of work around homeless as well as like getting youth on bicycles. Um, I partner with the Department of Transportation to ensure that we have a successful bike network in East Oakland. Can you talk a little bit about the workshop in San Francisco Public Library? Last year, um, San Francisco Public Library contacted Oakland Public Library to get in contact with RB because they wanted to, they had a bike theme as part of their summer reading program. They wanted to see if RB wanted to come out. RB and took a couple youth out to San Francisco. So if you can imagine a young person from Oakland, from East Oakland, probably never, not getting out of East Oakland much, heading across the bay to the bigger city and going out and doing workshops and showing people how to decorate and how to, how to make a scraper bike. It was pretty special for them to be able to get connected and do that. At the, the, the program was so successful here that it's actually now expanding and, and going into other cities as well. How's the program going now with COVID? Right now the program's on pause. I've been talking to ODOT staff about maybe doing something with the Slow Streets initiative that they got going on in East Oakland. When they come out um, and they shut the streets down, so people can exercise and, and be able to, to use a community car free. I'm working with ODOT to, to negotiate like how we can do bike giveaways, um, maybe even some fix a flat clinic, um, help me giveaways. People are wanting to bike right now so people can get outside and, and, and exercise and having more time to do that. People have been coming because they see us here and asking if we can fix their bikes. So I've kind of been doing this on the side where you could drop your bike off. When I get time, I'll work on it and I'll give it back to you. We can't do the workshop side by side right now, but we still want to be able to provide a service. Well, um, I mean, you know, I really appreciate you guys hopping on the bus and sharing what you're doing in East Oakland. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I can appreciate, you know, how you are certainly changing lives in your community. And, you know, that's what we, we want to hear. Anthony, RB, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, we're back. Oh my goodness. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I had a great time uh, listening and learning about the great work of these committed, committed folks in Oakland. Uh, Mahasin, Manny, Jason, Miriam, Anthony, RB, thank you once again for the inspiring work you're doing at Oakland Public Library. Honoring the voices of community is such a clear theme in the conversations I've had with you, and I commend you for your work. I think you've all helped us uh, reflect on our own practice as well, no matter what type of library we work in. So again, thank you so much. Now, everybody, uh, we have something special for you. We're gonna pivot real quick and we're going to bring in a whole group of new folks here. Uh, everybody seems to be on. Okay, all right, we're pretty good. And so, um, so speaking of honoring voices, we're, we're excited to be here with some young artists who have found theirs and expressed them through poetry and spoken word. I am pleased to be joined by Oakland Public Library staff and several of Oakland's Youth Poet Laureate finalists. Remember their names because I have no doubt you'll be hearing from them again. So congratulations to you all. So we'll get to the introduction, introductions in just one moment, but uh, let's jump right in with the first poem from Samuel. Thank you. Um, this poem is called Brook. Step, breathe, step, breathe, step, breathe, step, breathe, run, 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 run. It's all you know how to do, isn't it? Can't throw or catch, can't hit a ball with a bat, can't kick a ball into a net, can't do any of the things real men do, but you sure can run, can't you run? run away on the days when the rain makes the lake swell and overflow. I remember how Akrila wrote my name six years ago, hammered the Amharic Buruku into Brook with the crudeness of English letters trying to build something they have no business attempting to shape. And I feel myself become water, become a brook, become an overflow, trying to escape something it had no business attempting to be a part of in the first place, become running water, running, 
Gunshots fire, running, body surge at the starting line, running, a boy falls, running, we trample him, running, he gets up anyways, running, his coach yelling from the sidelines, a boy falls, and we trample him anyway. Running, nothing is more important than the race, nothing is more important than running on the days when the rain makes the lake swell. I remember how my body cried out, overflowed, cracked at the knees and fractured at the shins, begged me to stop running on the days when the rain makes the lake swell. I remember how I only speak in excess, only understand how to love too much of a bad thing or too much of a good thing for the wrong reasons. I remember how my body begged me to stop and I kept running anyways, kept running, running, running. The lake cries out, body swollen from too much of a good thing. And the rain laughs, keeps running. A boy cries out, body swollen from too much of a bad thing. But he keeps running anyways. A boy falls and we trample him, still running because nothing is more important than the race. Buruku, are we still running? Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, Samuel, please introduce yourself to everyone. Uh, my name is Samuel Getacho. I am 17 years old. I am a rising freshman at Yale University, where I'll be going in a few weeks. Um, and I served as the 2019 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate. Oh, wow. Thanks, Samuel. And let's meet the rest of the group and hear about the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate program. Peggy, can you in introduce us to everyone? Sure, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, we are so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be here and to share this program with everybody. My name is Peggy Simmons. I am a library assistant with the Teen Services Department of the Oakland Public Library. And from that job, I get to, I get the honor and privilege and joy of coordinating the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program. Um, and I do that, of course, with my whole team um, and with my boss, Sharon. Sharon, do you want to Introduce yourself. Sure. I'm um, Sharon McKellar. I'm a supervising librarian for teen services at the Oakland Public Library. So part of my job is working with Peggy on this program and it's uh, kind of a dream. I've been with OPL since 2003 and since the start of this program, even when it had nothing to do with my job, I've been really avidly following it and um, really supporting it. So I'm really excited that I get to do it as part of my work. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I also want to introduce you to one of our finalists for 2020, one of our Oakland Youth Poet Laureate 2020 finalists, Chiana. Chiana, would you like to introduce yourself further? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Chiana Griswa. I'm 16, as of this year, a rising senior. Um, and I kind of got into this program via my English teacher. And previous to this, I hadn't really been given, believe it or not, the specific stage to share my work in poetry. I had it writing and other things. So I think it is really incredible to be given such, such a, a, a space for poetry in general. Thanks. Thank you. We have another finalist from 2020 with us here today, Hunter. Hunter, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, my name's Hunter. I'm 15. I'm a rising sophomore. And what else was I supposed to say? Why did you, how did you hear about the program? How did you come into the program? Oh, um, well, my, in seventh grade, my mom showed me this writing competition thing, except I was two years too young, so we just put it on the calendar two years in advance. And awesome. <laughs> I don't think I'd heard that part of your story before. <laughs> and um, our fourth poet today, and you will be hearing poems from all of them um, over the course of the next 21 minutes. Um, our, our fourth poet, um, our 2020 Oakland Youth Poet Laureate is Greer. Greer, would you introduce yourself further, please? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Greer Nakadegawa Lee. I'm 16 years old and I'm a rising junior. And I got involved in this program when I went to an open mic that Samuel, who you already heard from, was emceeing. And um, I read a poem there, and afterwards, Peggy came up to me and asked me to apply for the program, and I am very glad that I did. 
We are also very, very glad that Greer applied for the program. We're happy for everybody who's applied uh, for the program. And I wanna tell you a little bit more about the Oakland Youth Poet Laureate Program. So since 2012, we have been inviting 13 to 18 year old Oakland poets to apply to join a community of young poets who then receive opportunities to perform all over town and beyond and to represent the youth of Oakland, run workshops and receive support and mentorship. Every year we have a panel of five judges, members of the community, um, who we try to get a panel who comes at poetry from different directions. Um, and then the laureate, the person who's named laureate, um, gets a $5,000 scholarship to the school of their choice, and they have certain responsibilities. Um, I'm gonna make sure to say right now that that scholarship is funded by Friends of the Oakland Public Library, and it's really the friends who fund so much uh, of this program. Um, you can donate to them, their link is in the chat. Um, it's really thanks to the donors, uh, to, to the friends and all the friends work that we can do this program. Um, and so we have, that, we have the laureate every year, but also all the finalists and now all the applicants get opportunities to perform and grow as poets. Our idea is really uh, to form a community of, of young poets who can be supporting each other. And of course, we can't do that without um, a whole slew of community partners, organizations, and people in the community who have been supporting us since the very beginning. Okay, um, I want to just say Greer that there have been a lot of great poets that have been discovered in open mic. So good job. Mm -hmm. mic. So I want to turn to Sharon. Um, and Sharon, how does the the uh, Oakland Youth Poet Lord uh, program fit into the library's vision for teen services and the mission of Oakland Public Library? It's a really good question. A lot of Youth Poet Laureate programs in other cities are not run through the library. They're run through more community organizations. Um, but we think it's a perfect fit for the library. So in teen services, we're always working to put teen voices up front. So everything we do in teen services is to center teens and to support them. Uh, we want to sort of help them build the life and the community and the world that they want to see. Uh, so we're not we're not sort of trying to tell them what to do or teach them so much as listening to them and then providing them opportunities and offering them guidance along the way. So clearly you can see how this program epitomizes that. We are offering them not just a poetry platform, but we're challenging them to think further and to go further in, in what their words can do. So exploring the power of their words and how they might be able to use them now and for the rest of their lives. So that's really important. Um, and then we also help build a community so that they can also turn to each other and inspire each other with, with their work and their words. And then in terms of the library in general, you know, as library workers, we are all centering our work kind of around information and opportunity and service to the entire community. And so, you know, at OPL, our mission statement is in, empowering all people to explore, connect and grow. Um, and it's, I think, obvious to people how that applies to the teens who are involved in our program, but what's maybe a little less obvious is how that also applies to other people in our community. So every adult that has the opportunity to hear these young people speak and um, read their poetry is given a huge opportunity for growth. Um, we think that's really important. They have so much to teach. And then every younger child or teenager who gets to work with these poets in, in poetry workshops and other places they go is also given the opportunity for growth and to explore their own voices. So we really think from the library, we're uniquely situated to make sure that this is impacting the whole community and not just the kids involved. And then lastly, um, unintentionally, but a little bit of a collateral outcome of our program is, is outreach. So it's not an outreach program, but it turns out that these poets are out there. They're all over the community. They're reaching thousands of people per year. Um, and so it's showing the community the work that the library is doing with young people. And it's also just putting the, the library's name out there into the community. So. Thanks. Thanks so much. Sharon, so you mentioned the power of words. So now we're gonna get out the way and we're gonna hear uh, a, a poem from Shiana.
There we go. Meet myself. Okay, great. So everyone can hear me good. I'm going to, I'm going to assume so. Great. So this is an original poem titled Branded. Just going to get into it. Maybe he reminds me of a comfort I used to see, self-adorned sophistication, field sown of blue blood to coax them a perfect green. He wears that prudent stare, like one of many deer caught in the ripple of the sunrise, where wealth stacks atop itself until it meets the wooded soul of the hills. That in my childhood, I floated just beside and never was a part of, could never touch. Now I can see the shade of furs in his eyes, the chill of foggy ridge tops bundled beneath his jackets. Nights of clean silence hum silver and soft in his breath and be a part of it. Touch my feet to it, crinkle my toes in all its warm willed hush. Love becomes a ritual. I can't sleep until I hear those words. So we all grow together, grow alone in the treasure of comfort. Why, why would you trade your heart, both lungs, the strength of your own blood for ham and cheese? Because with every bite, you wear the rings, jewels, goldens, richness of knowing, of thinking you've always known what is right and what is wrong. Because it is easy to feel safe atop your tidied wheeled and never think about what sleeps in the valley below, rains from the winds above. Easy to believe what has been baked and trimmed and ice for you kept you full as you slept to dream easy dreams is good and pure. The little boar's head smudged on a wrapper, chapletting ham and cheese sat with us always like a hungry dog. I'm sure it heard every word I said and ran late to class with us, cleaved to your stomach. I should know its name even. The color of its bland brand blisters ink over our summer days, that summer feeling you couldn't sleep without. Could the salts of all my life, the shadows behind the memories, the lifeless dusk I've drawn a face to, know me better than him or her, I say? As I lean into the arms, I'm convinced dark ambience grew somehow and whisper, hmm, how beautiful to really nothing in particular and everything I've known. That was beautiful, Chiana. Thank you so much. And I was watching you, Peggy, as, as she was reciting her poem and, and you were really, really into it as, as was I. So Peggy, how are these, uh, how are the voices and talents of these poets shared uh, with the city and audiences beyond the library walls? Um, they go wide beyond the library walls. I just want to thank uh, Chiana for that poem. I'm still sitting with it. It gave me such a strong feeling. Um, um, actually, the library for them is, I like to think of it as kind of a home base where they can come and check in with us at any time, or at least when we're open, that is true. And, and much of the program exists outside of the library walls. Um, Pre-COVID, the booking requests that we were getting for the poets to perform, not just the laureate, but all the poets, um, were the biggest part of my part-time job, just, just dealing with those bookings and getting those young people out there. Um, the, the booking requests are ramping up again now for virtual events. Um, but finalists and laureates, uh, including from previous years, are invited to perform at schools, street fairs, churches, huge fundraisers, small gallery openings, business association lunches, radio programs, podcasts, I, I could go on and on. We ourselves organize uh, four regular events a year outside the library. One at a local youth organization, Chapter 510, at an independent bookstore at Pegasus, and at the local museum, the Museum of California. Um, and we also have the poets come in and perform for staff um, whenever possible. Um, we also partner with Chapter um, 510, the local youth organization, and a well-known local illustrator and author to make a poster of each laureate. And that poster is free, and so it goes all over um, as well. There's so much that they do. I want to give you just some highlights. Um, and all of these, if you go, our program page is in the chat and you can get more information about all of these things. But some of, just some of our highlights. 
very recently, our vice laureate from last year, our 2019 vice laureate, Eleanor Wickstrom, she was part of the UN's commemoration of their 75 years of its charter. So she was in an international event with a very, very powerful video. Um, please do watch it. Layla Motley, our 2018 laureate, did a poem video with YR Media that got 94,000 views. I'm just gonna say that again. 94,000 views just on Facebook. It was a love letter to Oakland. Samuel uh, was in conversation last year with the novelist Tommy Orange um, with Standing Room Only. He and Layla also hosted an event with Angie Thomas and MK Asante, also Standing Room Only. These young people have done poetry workshops in schools and gotten the student writing out into the world on postcards, in books, and on very creative websites. I could really go on for a very long time about how these young people put themselves out into the world, their words, and also inspire others to do the same, including uh, younger, younger young people. Um, so you can check out some of the highlights on our project page. And I just want to say that these are amazing experiences for our young poets. They tell us how they feel their voices validated, that they learn amazing skills for walking into a room of strangers and answering their questions. Obviously, they're supporting the voices of other young people in Oakland and putting those words out there. But what I personally love most about this program, something Sharon talked a little bit about before, is how many adults get to hear these young people. We need to learn learn from these young people. Um, usually staff don't talk so much in these, adult, in these, in these um, events that we do because um, we really we want adults to learn from the young people themselves and to be moved and affected by them and in a way we usually aren't as adults. We're not very good at listening to young people especially when we're in conversation with them and I'm convinced that we listen better to them uh, to young people when we listen to their poetry, because then we can't escape the importance of what they're saying because we're impacted emotionally. Samuel's poem, Shiana's poem earlier, you all felt that, I felt that, and we can't help but be moved and changed by them if we listen to them in that way. So I love this program mostly, there's wonderful things about it, but the thing I love best is how adults can be affected and changed by it. No, no, thank you so much, Peggy, for that. And, and I believe we've already shared some of the booking information uh, in the chat box for everyone. Um, but, you know, we're just happy to be able to uh, bring these poets in this program to a national audience. And with that, I'm sure they want to hear more of the poets and less of me. So I'm going to get out of the way and we're going to hear from Hunter now. Hunter? Hi. Um, okay. This is really short, but... It's called Lies, and it's, anyway. Uh, behind this smile, I'm struggling to breathe as the weight of my own mind crushes my lungs with worries a kid never should have carried and problems that never should have been mine. Beyond these eyes, a flimsy dam of pride threatens to break under the pressure of an ocean of unspoken truth. Beneath this brave 15-year-old is an exhausted child, all alone, lost in a forest corrupted by poisoned thoughts. Below this strong outward attitude is a ruined doll, a plaything of life broken and discarded. Behind these jokes and poems and stories and art, I'm telling you the truth. I'm screaming out, I'm not fine. I'm begging you to look deeper. I'm crying out for help, you see. Those words I told you were a whole bunch of damn lies. I like that one. <laughs> no, really, I like that one quite a bit. Thank you so much, Hunter. I mean, I feel like um, those of you who, who know me know I, I, I play drums. I feel like I should have brought my djembe and I should have like really participated with, with these poets because I really, really love what I'm hearing right now. But this has just uh, been a real treat. And we want to thank, thank you and everyone at Oakland Public Library for connecting with us, with your amazing work. We look forward to an in-person visit um, real soon when it's safe to travel. So thank you, youth poets. Keep questioning, challenging, and creating. The world needs you, needs to hear your thoughts, fears, desires, and dreams. And we all need to listen to your voices. All of your voices are important to us. And I often say, um, they say that the youth is the future, but I say the youth is now. 
now is the youth time. So we, we can't wait for the youth um, there now. So I want to thank um, our co-hosts at the California Library Association, uh, to our ALA members, and everyone who has joined us today. Uh, we're going to go out with a poem from Oakland's 2020 Youth Poet Laureate, who, by the way, already has a published book of poetry, ladies and gentlemen. So this is, this is a published poet already. Um, and the title of that uh, book of poetry is Heart Full of Hallways. There it is, there it is, Sharon. <laughs> and we'll share all that information in the chat box. So at this time, I am gonna get out of the way and Greer, please take it away. Uh, hey everyone. Um, this poem is called Dear America, and before I start reading it, I want to give a quick content warning for violence and police brutality. Dear America, what is so hard about calling a rose a rose? About calling blood, blood, police kill an unarmed black woman in her own home, and suddenly murder isn't murder anymore. Suddenly, there's a whole lot of questions piling up about what people deserve. America, can you call a gun a gun? Can you call a child a child without adding that he was no angel? Can you call a kid a kid even when you kill him for whistling or throwing bread or playing in the park? America, do you know a lynching when you see it? Not since you pretended to close the history books on the KKK have you listened to us talk about the nooses swaying in the trees and not accused us of overreacting. Call it what it is, America. Not just troubling, not a misunderstanding, not a coincidence. Call it a threat on your citizens' lives and then act like it. America, remember tear gas is a war crime when you're using it on your own civilians. Call a rose a rose. Call a murderer a murderer, even when he has a badge. Call yourself a country that cares more about white traditions than black lives, and then remember that it's true. America, there are nooses growing in your trees again. America, I'm begging you, don't wait around for the harvest. Thank you. Wow. That was a powerful note to end on. I'm gonna just say this one last thing. Um, I, Oakland Public Library is making me wanna be a kid again and move to Oakland because you're doing so many great things. Um, thank you, Greer. Thank you, everyone.